Welcome to the War World of Lord Russell, Lord Russell's regular podcast in which he talks about all the things he has done in his life. Uh, my name's Edward Cousins Lake. I'll be chatting to Lord Russell this week. And bearing in mind the World Cup in Qatar is on at the moment, very relevant, very controversial, but nevertheless, everybody's talking about football. We thought we'd talk about Lord Russell's involvement with football this morning. Russell, hi there. Yeah, good morning, Ed. Welcome. And what a yeah. fantastic time it is in the World Cup right now. Some incredible results. My God. I, I can't believe it. You know, uh, where we are at the moment, at the time of recording this podcast, Japan have just beaten Germany, Argentina have beaten Saudi Arabia, and Canada last night. I couldn't oh. believe it. Well, they didn't score. I just don't know. They, they, they've never scored in World Cups. Okay. They missed a penalty to get rid of that hoodoo. And then, what was it, 16, 18 shots? And not yeah. only but two or three on target. It was, it was woeful up front. But they should have won the match. Incredible. You were right. Up until they got to the penalty area, they looked as good as any team I've seen in the World Cup. And then they oh. were like, they were like a Sunday League side then. <laughs> <laughs> they just didn't have the power up front, did they? But, you know, they didn't. They had some fantastic midfield play. They really did. Defensively, were quite strong too. Yeah, good side, apart from their attacking good, yeah. balls. I mean, you, you, obviously you're not playing in the World Cup. Big miss for the game that you're not out there, you know, playing for England. But uh... Oh, that would have been great. That would have been fantastic, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> but never in a million years would that ever would have happened in my life. But, um, you know, I enjoy football. So that's the main thing. Well, you have. You've had quite an involvement with it, haven't you? You've, you've played the game and to quite a high level. You've been involved in sponsorship. Uh, yes. You've certainly been involved deeply at non-league level, and you, you've arranged charity matches. So we'll we'll start right at the beginning. And your your first footballing love, which I understand was Chelsea. Yeah, Chelsea Football Club. Yeah, I can remember remember as a child actually following Chelsea right from the early days when I was I wasn't very old really. I don't know why it just sunk into my veins. Um, and I can remember you know the the sixty seven FA Cup final when Chelsea lost to uh, Tottenham two one at Wembley. I don't. I don't remember watching or seeing the '65 League Cup final um, when Chelsea beat Leicester City three-two over two legs. But that was a, a, a great trophy win. And in that side, of course, then um, was a chap called John Mortimer, um, who sadly passed away last year. I, I recently found out. And John, actually, I knew quite well. He was the brother of Charlie, who used to train me. Uh, uh, football, which we'll get onto, I'm sure, as we go through this podcast. But John, John did teach me technical drawing at, at school. We, he got sacked as Portsmouth manager, taught me technical drawing for a while, which is great. So I had some great conversations with John, particularly about Chelsea Football Club, professional football, um, and uh, along with his brother, John knew knew of me because Charlie had obviously spoken about about me to John, and we had some great conversations. He then left and went off to manage Benfica. Or oh, the rest I was is history. Say. He's a he's a huge part of their history, isn't he? He's a legend oh, in, out there. Absolute legend. He's got a statue of him actually as well at Benfica's ground. Uh, won all all sorts of competitions, you know, national league trophies, cups, and 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 you know did so well for Benfica. And it's so sad to hear of his loss last year. But he played two hundred and seventy nine matches for Chelsea uh, in the late sixties. And um, uh, never missed a game. Was first t- first name on the team sheet. Fantastic centre half. I can't remember if he played six or five, but uh, he was a strong, strong workhorse at the back. Of the and, and that was that was where the number on your back meant the position you played, wasn't it? Oh yeah, none of this twenty five <laughs> and sixty nine and forty two and whatever these days. No, the numbers meant something in those days, didn't they? Ed? They really were five and six yeah. at the back. Fantastic. Number five, you were a centre half. You were Jack Charlton or, or whoever. Yeah, absolutely. And my number was originally number four, which you know, we talked about in my autobiography, of course, as well. So that was my first number when I played four on the back. Yeah, but of course, Bremner. your idol. As, yeah, I was going to say your idol was Billy Bremner, wasn't it? Yeah, it was indeed. I mean, he had a, he had a fantastic way about him, didn't he? And uh, when you go back and you watch those early days of the Leeds, the Leeds United side, particularly when they were playing against Chelsea, there was always something going on in those games. And Billy Bremen was always in there, left his foot in, you know, tackles with Johnny Giles and all those great guys. And then you look at the Chelsea side with Chopper Harris. And, you know, it was, it was just incredible. The earth remover, David Webb at the back in those days, because John Morton would obviously retired at that stage. Great matches. Proper well, I remember, read, I remember reading a piece about the 1970 FA Cup final when Chelsea played Leeds and, and they watched it with a, with a modern day referee. And he said, actually... Oh. By about half time, most of the players would have had red cards yes. if it was the rest by today's standards. <laughs> Absolutely, I remember that. And uh, they, in fact, the game wouldn't have finished, would it? The rules no, would have said wouldn't. they would have to have uh, abandoned the match. 
because there'd be nobody on the field to play. I mean, that's, that's right. That's the difference in today's game as compared to uh, going back in those days, the 50s, 60s and 70s. Great football in those days. Amazing. And, of course, the other thing is the pitches they played on were dreadful. Oh, absolutely awful. Woeful pitches. And when I was at Farnborough Town, their pitch was disgraceful. Absolute mud heap every year uh, during the winter months, you know, bogged down in the middle. But, of course, now you go to Farnborough Town, it's absolute bays. It's a beautiful ground, beautiful pitch. Yeah, even but at that's... that level, the pitches are beautiful now, aren't they? Oh, they're stunning. And um, really, if you can't play on these pitches today, you'll never play on any any surface. But, yeah, playing on those mud heaps of yesteryear, we always remember the baseball ground at Derby County. Barbara Town. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Barbara Town was woeful. And, uh, you know, it was just a mud heap. It was just incredible. But they, they were the days. They were. And, and talking of that Chelsea side, you have actually invaded the pitch at the shed, at the uh, Stamford Bridge, haven't you? Oh, I did, yeah. I do remember that one very well. I think it was about 1977, 78, something like that. Chelsea were, were, were in the second division then, uh, believe it or not, you know. Um, they 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 were uh, uh, they were top of the league. They were winning to go up. And I think um, they're playing at home to Hull City. And uh, and this particular game, they, they had to win. And if they won, they were promoted. And, of course, Chelsea won 4 nil. But uh, after the third goal went in, they had primitive fencing around the, the ground in those days. And, of course, I was in the shed end and like an um, errant little little child, um, naughty schoolboy, I suppose. I was over that fence like you would not believe when the third, third goal went in. And I think it was Steve Finneston that scored it. And I can remember running onto the pitch and this noise behind me. And I look back. And everybody was hanging onto the fence. The fence went down, and of course, all the supporters then ran on. But I ran onto the pitch, got to the centre circle, and uh, Eddie McCready, who was the Chelsea manager in those days, and what a great player he was too in his day, came running on, and he said, "Get off the pitch!" I won't say the word <laughs> because we're broadcasting here. But uh, and I looked and I said, "Hi, Eddie. Well done. Great stuff. We're going to go up. We're you know Chelsea back in the Division One." And uh, anyway, I stood talking to Eddie on the centre circle for quite a while. He calmed down and we had a good chat. In the end, uh, he said, look, can you please leave the pitch? Because we need to finish the game, Russell. And I said, uh, thanks, Eddie. I'll leave now. And uh, on the way off the pitch, I just grabbed a bit of turf, put it in my pocket, as you do. And nonchalantly, just walked off the pitch and went back into the ground, uh, along with everybody else. And, uh, you know, the funny thing was, um, I got my picture in the back page of the Sunday People the following day. So uh, I remember my father waking me up saying, what have you been doing, Russell? <laughs> and uh, he threw the, the Sunday people at me, and there was I on the back page with Eddie McCready, myself, and a friend of mine, actually, as well, who came running on just behind me and come and joined me. And, uh, and I said, oh, yeah. And then the headlines were incredible. It said, um, war at the bridge. War? What war? <laughs> heavens above and it said Chelsea fans raid the pitch before the flare-up well of course there was no flare-up there was no war it was just celebrations Chelsea had won promotion I was going to uh, say yeah yeah it was it gutter. was love at the bridge really wasn't it oh it was love at the bridge a gutter press edge you know come on they got worse since I think but um you know it's just unbelievable and I walked into school I was a schoolboy then remember so I walked into school and Charlie Mortimer um who we'll get on to I'm sure shortly he called me into his office he said oh Baker, he says. I said, uh, oh, hello. He says, come here. So I walked into his office and uh, he, again, he threw the paper at me. He said, what's this? So I had to explain to him what happened. And then he turned around and said, oh, well, that's OK then. Um, we've got a match off Wednesday. We've got a winners match, a cup match on Wednesday. So then we just went on to talking about the next school match and, and so on. But that was what it was like. You know? Charlie was a nice, nice man. He was deputy head. He was um, the sports master. He, he loved his football. Well, he played professional oh, football anyway. Uh, and what a privilege job. as a schoolboy to be coached by somebody who went on to coach at the very highest level in the game. And Benfica are one of the great clubs in European football history. Not That's world, quite something, yeah. isn't it? It's quite something. And uh, when when you've had that experience of both Charlie and John Mortimer, Charlie Mortimer and John Mortimer, both professional footballers, I think Charlie, uh, when he was playing for Aldershot, of all, of, of all teams, one of my, my love, love of football clubs, um, scored the first uh, six goals on match the day going back in the day. So that was for Aldershot. I forget who they were playing, but he was a great player. You know, he played for Woking in the amateur um, cup final um, going back in the 60s. And I think at Woking won 2 0 at Wembley. You know, so he had a lot of bad in the England under 23 international, amateur international. Uh, and of course, his brother John, um, 279 appearances for Chelsea. Great player, great centre half. And, Fantastic. Uh, all the history. And, and 
you know, I, 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 I'm aware that people will say, oh, you old guys, you know, you're always talking about how much better the game was back in the day. It wasn't better in a lot of ways, but it was different, wasn't it? The game did belong to the supporters then. It did, and uh, the game was much slower, of course, as well. When you compare matches today, they're athletes, aren't they, now? Uh, of a lot of pace in the ground, not a lot of pace in the game. But in those days, it was a lot slower. Um, you didn't have to be as fit, and I think that was obvious when you look at some of the players in the day. And also the referees were very unfit. And mm. I can remember, uh, and the linesman too, and I can remember Charlie Mortimer saying to me, um, Russell, he says, uh, they've got a great centre centre forward in this side today. I think we're playing a side in the Hampshire Cup again, from Portsmouth, big side. He said, what I want to see is I want to see you mark him in the first five minutes, let him know you're there. I want to see you put your studs down his ankles, his shins. <laughs> let him know you're there because then he's going to be worried for the rest of the match. And that's what I did. That's how I was taught to play, Ed. Uh, hard, in there with a strong tackle, studs up, sliding tackles. You don't see sliding tackles anymore. Uh, but I used to slide in with tackles. And, you know, just as I was going in to get the ball, got the ball, foot up, player down. Always lifted my leg and studs in. It was always the way. Because then once you've done that in the first five, ten minutes, those players were never going to be the same again for the rest of the game. And, that's and it was an art, wasn't it? The tackle was an art. I remember the tackle, the, the great tackle of Bobby Moore playing for mm. England against Brazil. He wins the ball. Oh. as calmly as you like. And he walks away with the ball, looks up and just plays a pass. Yeah. And it's a magnificent sequence to look at. And when you look at the likes of Bobby Moore, who did that, he was an artisan, wasn't he, really? Because he would get the ball fairly, win it fairly. As you say, look up. He looked strong and powerful, respectful, and always played the ball left or right, didn't he? Down the mm. channels. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And yeah. that was hit. That was Bobby Moore, a fantastic football player. And against the likes of Pele and the Brazilians, and he's still cool. Exactly. Calm and collected. Amazing. Well, that was in the 1970 World Cup, wasn't it, that game? It was. Uh, and Pele always called him my friend, Bob Moore, which that's right. to have Pele called you my friend, that's something. <laughs> well, I think the three, the three ones in those days was Pele, Moore and Beckenbauer, wasn't it? The three, yes. they, they, were, they were good friends with each other, really. Brazil, Germany and England. Fantastic. Uh, you don't get that these days, do you, so much? But You respect. don't. I, I, you, ha you had the characters in the day. And I want to talk about Charlie Cook, who was one mm. of the characters at Chelsea. And he oh, gave yeah. you a very unique souvenir, didn't he? He did indeed. I remember Charlie. He was a great, great player, as we know, Scottish international. And uh, you know what he could do with the ball was, was, was legendary. You know, we, we talk about Maradona uh, and so on these days, which, you know, yes, better players in, in, in the modern game. But Charlie was an absolutely fantastic football player. And I went to watch uh, Ch Chelsea representing side play um, against the British Army at the Aldershot Military Stadium going back in the early 70s. And I, was, I must have only been about 12, I think, 13 years of age, something like that. But you know, I went to the match and uh, I knew the stadium quite well because I'd, I'd done a lot of athletics there over the years, even as a young kid uh, in, in, in uh, sort of county matches and county running games and so on, championships. So I knew, I knew where the changing rooms were and I knew the, the pitch quite well too from that perspective. And at the end of the game, I ran onto the pitch and went up to went up to Charlie Cook. And, you know, being the person that I am, very talkative, I, was, I talked a lot in my younger days too, which got me into a lot of trouble uh, with, with school and parents and other people. But, you know, but then that's what it is. You, that's my personality. So I was talking to Charlie and uh, as we walked off the pitch, he was chatting away, chatting away. And the long walk off the pitch by one of the goals back to where the changing rooms were, which is quite a stroll. And at the end there, he said, um, Russell said, that's a fantastic conversation. He said, really enjoyed talking to you. He said, please continue supporting Chelsea. Oh, and if you're hungry, here's my apple, my apple core. So he actually gave me the, the remains of his apple <laughs> core and said, enjoy my apple, and then walked off. Big smile on his face. So I stood there with Charlie Cook's apple core in my hand and put it in my pocket. And uh, that, 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 yeah, To a youngster, that's like being given the Holy Grail, isn't it? If oh, it's given to you by a footballer. Crikey, especially with somebody like Charlie Cook, you know, you've got yeah. he's personally given you his half eaten apple. What what a fantastic trophy. You know, it's better yeah, than winning yeah. the FA Cup, really. But um for me as a young star, or young, not young star, but young player, um, as a youngster, um, that was just incredible. I always remember that. I think Charlie probably would now if you asked him. Because that yeah, was a great quite, conversation. Quite possibly. Oh, yeah. I remember him. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so oh that's you, uh, you did yeah. play. You, you played for Farnborough Town. At what yes. position were you? Um, when I was playing for Farnborough, I played at uh, right back, number two. So originally I was number four, 
Um, but I moved into the into the, the right back position, and that was the reason. The reason why I went right back was Charlie Mortimer uh, came up with the idea. He said, "Look, Russell, you're a very fast runner." He said, "You're you know you're 100 meters phenomenal speed." Um, he said, "The 200 meters, great, great, great. You've got the legs, you've got the distance. You can last 90 minutes, no problem. Go right back." And we we formed what was the early days then of the wing backs. Well, I was literally was up and down the right wing all the time, moving into a, a, a right wing position, coming inside, coming back, defending, just nonstop up and down that right flank all the time as a youngster. And that's where I, I became the, the right back and uh, and then signed for Farnborough Town and played right back position for Farnborough. So and this uh, is this is Charlie this is Charlie Mortimer being ahead of his time, really, isn't it? Because you, you didn't yeah. have overlapping right backs back then. No, you didn't. They, they defended. And it used to confuse people. I mean, I'd get forward and, and other teams would think, what's going on here? It was just absolutely, it would shake them a little bit. And I'd cut inside. Now, I was both left and right footed as well, so that bamboozled players. So I could cut in on, on the right hand side, go left on my left, move it about, put the ball inside. I could knock a ball left and right foot and even, even shoot left and right foot as well. I'd get myself into goal scoring positions. I didn't score many goals, but I'd scored a few. And they're usually around about 22 yards out, left or right foot just a screamer um but my left foot was just as strong as my right in those days which is great and and I, think many players. I, I think it's fair to say you were a good player and, and you could have gone on and played certainly uh, we've discussed this before at, at football league level mm. because you had you had an injury you suffered an injury didn't you yeah i i uh i had the the the, the, the stress of a really bad injury um where uh, a player come across me i think it was playing down at portsmouth at the time and um, I think it was a farmer in a Hampshire um, senior cup match and um, at Fratton Park. And of course, no, that was that Fratton Park was another particular thing. This was this was in the, the next round because we beat Portsmouth in that particular round. And this player came across me and literally I was doing my wing back thing. I was down the right flank, uh, just about to cut inside looking up. And this player came straight across studs high and uh, right across my uh, my right kneecap. And of course, that was it. It was just knee torn to pieces. Uh, the the actual bone as well was pushed to one side, and all my ligaments, cruciates, were all torn, and that was the end. Finished. No more football. You, you you do wonder if their coach had been similar to John in that they knew that you were a right back who played as a winger. Yes. And maybe they need they wanted to nail you quite early on and get you out of the game. But but you know, there's taking people out of the game is one thing, but actually causing them a an injury that might end their career is another, isn't it? That's that's unacceptable at any time. Yeah, it is unacceptable. I mean, I was a hard player, don't get me wrong. And they always say, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And I would go in hard, but and maybe hurt a few people, but not not to end their careers. Mm. It would just be bruises and a few knocks. Um, um, but yeah, this was a career-ending uh, situation. So when I went back to Farnborough, um, they had a wonderful physiotherapist, um, just lived down the road from the ground, actually, uh, a, a lady. And she was a, a blind lady. I forget her name. But she said to me, and my father was with me at the time as well, she said, look, Russell, um, if you don't stop playing football now, you're going to be in a wheelchair at 30. And she was quite strong about it. My cruise shoots were completely torn anyway, so I couldn't play. And in those days, you couldn't get cruise shoot ligament repairs. You can now. But, so that was the end of my career, really. And it's, it's a bit of a knock, you know, because all that social life you have in sports, gone. It's not, not the same anymore. You, you miss that, that changing room banter. After yeah, match I, fans are. I find this. I mean, I've, I've obviously worked with a few pros footballers in, in my work, and they all say, without exception, the thing I miss the most when I'm not playing is the banter. Absolutely. The banter's the thing. And it, 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 and that's where your spirit comes from. You're the pre-match, the, the, the half-time, the post-match. Having a couple of drinks in the players' bar with players afterwards, and, you know, all that's gone all of a sudden. Yeah, you can still go along and watch and be part of it to a degree, but it's gone, and that's that's a shame. But you never you never stayed away from the game, did you? No, <clears throat> excuse me, because you got involved. You got involved with Lower Stoft Town. I did, and uh, I understand you, your your company at the time you sponsored the stadium. Yeah, Amateur Events um, uh, Limited. I, well, Amateur Events, a uh, company I formed to to put on promotions of sport with darts and snooker and obviously football as well. Um, we decided that um, we would we would get into the non-league game, and I, I sponsored Lowestoft Town Football Club for two years, buying the, the the ground naming rights. So Lowestoft 
town, which is now back to their Crown Meadow name, was called the Amberdew Event Stadium. And a fantastic couple of years as, as well there, really. Great fun at last of Town Football Club. And they've got a, a, a real buzz in my heart too. I always look for their results and go along every now and again to watch them. And, uh, you know, I'm always welcomed at last of Town Football Club by the chairman and um, and also the, the other directors and the supporters as well. Lovely club. Yes, and of course, this suddenly makes me think off script. Tottenham Hotspur, they're still looking for a stadium sponsor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wouldn't it be lovely? But, you know, you've got to remember that with football, any investment in football is really dead money because you're never going to get your money back. It's just one of those things that uh, you do. I, I guess it's not, if you look at Tottenham Hotspur or any other big club, it's a millionaire's game billionaire's game where in, in my in my situation i'm far from being any of that um, it's just a, a passion for local football and to get involved with a, a local football club non-league club like lower stuff and to help them financially and put some spirit into the club as well but was great and i i go on the the, the team coaches um away uh uh you know for, for those matches and it would be brilliant absolutely fantastic and you were and, uh, you were mistaken, weren't you? Um, I think by the BBC, no less, as, as the chairman of the club, such was your involvement and people associating you with, with Lowestoft. Yes, I can remember standing at this train station one, one morning, it was about quarter past seven in the morning, and my mobile phone rang. They said, oh, hello, is that Lord Russell? I said, yes. He said, um, uh, this is uh, BBC Radio Suffolk. We'd like to do an interview with you uh, about Lowestoft Town with their financial problems at the time. Uh, would you be prepared to come on and do a live interview before the news at half seven? I said, well, shouldn't you be speaking to the chairman of the football club? Um, they said, well, you are the chairman, Lord Russell. I said, no, <laughs> I'm not. They said, well, OK, uh, if you're not the chairman, would you still like to do the interview? I said, yes, of course. So I got onto the train and then uh, before the news at half seven on this this, this morning, I gave a live interview about Lowestoft Town Football Club. Um, but that that was all, that happened all the time. I was always being interviewed at the grounds um, by various reporters uh, talking about the club, talking about the match, various tactics and things. So it was all good fun, really. I enjoyed, well, I enjoyed those moments. Maybe at this point we should quickly name check who was the chairman at the time, just to give him a mention. Yeah, Gary Keyser. Uh, hello, Gary. Gary Keyser still is the chairman, of course. Um, and Gary Keyser did actually want me to become chairman because Gary Keyser was going to step down. But it wasn't the right time for me to think of those things. And, and Gary's come back and is now operated as chairman again at Lowestoft Town Football Club and doing very well. So um, good luck to the club. Good luck to Gary. Good luck to the, uh, the supporters and the players. Definitely. But of course, to help them with their financial problems, you arranged a football night or two at the club, didn't you? And, and the first one, you, you took along two very famous exit switch players with you. Yes, Terry Butcher and George Burley. What a great experience that was to interview those guys live on stage. Absolutely incredible. And to open those those two players up as well on stage in front of quite a nice audience was, was exceptional. And to get Terry to talk about some of the things you'd never hear in football was incredible. Um, and of course, one of the things I said to Terry at the time, I went off cue card. I said, Terry, I said, look, I've got this picture in my mind, 1986, World Cup quarter final in the Azteca, Mexico City. I said, um, there's you sat on, on the green bay, as your head in your hands, and this diminutive little figure's running past you with his hands <laughs> up. He's just scored probably the best ever goal in World Cup history. But it's not the hand of God goal either. It's a goal where he ran past five players, England players, to score Argentina's second. And I said, Terry, one of those players he ran past, one of those five, was you. I said, um, can you tell us a little bit about that that in that situation and what happened what were you thinking so he stood up looked at me he said some words i won't repeat because we're, we're broadcasting and went to the front of the stage and said oh i can't stand i won't use the words he used maradona and he was <laughs> off you know absolutely brilliant and i couldn't i couldn't stop him he was gone he was into all sorts of stories fantastic but to uh, be but fair, that, Terry was only one of five or six at Maradona ran round that evening, wasn't he? So yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's five. Then of course Shilton at the end to put it into two 0 A game we should have won, really. But uh, that hand of God goal was was awful, wasn't it? Really. But yeah, one of one of the great paid for England defeats, of which there have been uh, uh, many. And of course, the story recently was that Steve Hodge got. Uh, Diego Maradona's shirt after that game, didn't he? He did. sold it for a lot of money. He did. He did. He <clears> did get that shirt. And uh, yeah, I think it, when did, when did he sell it? Two weeks ago or something, was it? It's quite recent. Not that long ago, no. And um, yeah, it went for an awful lot of money. And quite right to say too. I think the referee kept the football, didn't he, as well? That's that's up for sale very soon, I think. It uh, is. So that will, again, that will make, and that's, of course, 
at the time when you had one ball pretty much for the whole match. If you score a exactly. hat-trick in a game, though, you're never quite sure if the ball you get was even the one you scored your goals with. No, exactly. And in those days, it was the ball, wasn't it? You got the ball that yeah. you scored those goals with. Yeah, it's called different now. But yeah. And, 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 and you went on to do more of these. You did one uh, for Norwich, didn't you, with, with uh, you and Roberts and Darren Huckabee. Again, what yeah. a pairing. Oh, great pairing. Icons of Norwich City Football Club. And uh, someone said to me, you won't get Darren to speak. I said, yes, I will. I, he couldn't stop. I had him just rabbiting all the way through. It's fantastic. <laughs> but the, the thing that sticks in my mind was Ewan Roberts. I said to him, Ewan, I said, you know, um, arguably one of your best times in football wasn't, wasn't at Norwich. It was at Leicester City when they were playing at the old Filbert Street ground. And uh, he said, yes. I said, and you're an icon there. I said, the supporters actually made up a song about you. I used to sing it at the games, home and away. Uh, I said, they even sing it today in the Premier League. So your, your song is still bouncing around the new ground and uh, uh, away matches in the Premier League. And you looked at me and said, I'm not singing it, Russell. So I looked at the audience. I said, who's heard you and song? And one guy stood up and said, yeah, I have, Lord Russell. I've heard it. It's brilliant. And um, I said, uh, Ewan, I said, um, I said, who wants to hear you and sing it, sing the song? Everybody said yes. There was a mass applause of yes. Come on, Ewan. And I looked around at Ewan and Ewan looked at me. He shook his head. He said, you, and I won't say the word. He stood up and he sung his song in front of everybody. And it was amazing. What an experience. And we sat down and we looked and smiled at each other, shook hands and carried on with the interview live on stage. Brilliant moment. One of those classics. I think, I think any, any fan of any club that you and Roberts has played for who's met him, and there will be many, will probably say he's one of the nicest people in football you'll ever meet. Yeah, he's a lovely fella. And he uh, still lives in and around Norwich. I still see him sometimes in Waitrose with his wife, you know, lovely fella. And of course, works now for BBC uh, Radio Wales. So he'll be out reporting on the World Cup for Wales. He will. And he'll, yes. of course, he's fluent in Welsh, isn't he? So he's, he he'll be doing it in that. So, yeah, Very good, good, good old Very Ewan. Fluent. Good old Ewan, indeed. Now, you, you obviously, you know, you've organised these, uh, these football events and you'll be doing more in the future. And, and you've got a darts one coming up and we'll end on that. Uh, t today, just to give that a bit of a plug. Um, but football charity matches, you've played in those as well, haven't you? I have, yeah. Again, uh, with the likes of Robert Flack and my good friend Peter Mendham and other players too, you know, of the ilk. You know, we've we've had some fun over the years. And um, we've had some that have been cancelled too because of COVID. We were due to play in a charity event at Carry Road at Norwich. Uh, and a great team I assembled for that too. And um, of course, it got cancelled because of COVID. So, well, you know, but yeah, I played in a great one at uh, Lars Stoft. Um, uh, then, of course, um, uh, not not the amateur event stadium at that stage. It was that came later. But we had some great matches there. We're all raising good money for local charities. Brilliant. And I wish that to continue too. Hopefully, it can do. Um, well, we should post. we should say at this stage, and we're sort of drawing to a close now. But anybody who wants to uh, take part in one of the matches, either to play if they're an ex player, or somebody who wants to obviously uh, make a donation to play in the spot in the game, or to sponsor it or host it, they just need to contact you, don't they? Just get in touch with me. Absolutely. And uh, we'll, we'll look to organise a, a charity match, football match. Brilliant. Perfect. Now, at the time we're doing this podcast, uh, coming up, there's still domestic football being played in England. And it's the FA Cup second round on Saturday. And you're very good friends with Stephen Cleave, the, the chairman of Kings Lynn. And you're going to be there on Saturday for one of the biggest games in their recent history, aren't you? Absolutely. Stephen is borough at home. I've sat with Stephen Cleave, actually, in the director's box on Saturday. And it's live on BBC as well. So it's quite, quite fantastic. My lady for Patch is going to be with me, too. So it's, it's going to be a great afternoon of football um, at, at Kings Lynn Town Football Club. So if they win, oh, well, who, third round, oh, who knows? It'd be fantastic if they win the game fantastic. and wish, wish them all the luck in the world. I was born in Kings Lynn and all, although I'm known as a big Norwich fan, they're, they're always been a, there's always been a place in my heart for the Linnets and Absolutely. that would just be great, that would just be great if they win and get into, would the, be. into the third round. Looking forward to it. Saturday's going to be a great day. Yes. amazing. Let's day. let's let's end let's end on the dance yes. because you've got a, you've got an event coming up, haven't you? So do you want to tell the listeners about that? Yeah, I got dance at Kings Lynn Town Football Club on in February the third. It's a Friday night at Kings Lynn. Um, got Keith Della, two former world champions, Keith Della, Steve Beaton. Got the voice Russ Bray as well, and myself to interview these three guys too. So it's going to be a fantastic evening of darts at the Kings Lynn Football Club on February the third, Friday, February the third next year. Wonderful. We're looking forward to it. Outstanding night of darts. It's be... you, you can either come as a VIP, can't you, or, or just you as, can. A, as a member. VIP tickets for sale, tables, and also just stand up, normal entry. So it's going to be a great night. 
Uh, and what's the best to. way of people to contact you with regard to that? Oh, we'll get in, club, uh, get in touch with the football club, Kingsland themselves. They've, they've got the, they're selling tickets online at the club. Just go onto the Kingsland Town website and uh, buy your tickets there. So um, I'll Excellent. see you there in February. Well, and of course, if anybody happens to have a copy of Keith Dallas' book, which uh, <clears throat> I, uh-huh. I just happened to, I, I had a small part in uh, <laughs> writing. In, Absolutely. In helping to create. I'm sure they can bring it along. And Keith, who's a lovely guy, well, I'm sure he'd sign it for them. He, he would do. He would do. Keith, Keith has, is a great guy, so he'd have no problem in, in signing books. So, yeah, bring it along if you've got a copy. Absolutely. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, this, this is the first pod we've done together. Hugely enjoyable. Absolutely. Always. Uh, there'll, there'll be more to come. Keep listening to the world of Lord Russell. It's on Spotify and other platforms. It is um, indeed. You, you may even be listening to it on Spotify at the moment. If there's anything you want us to talk about, I think it's fair to say you'll, you'll talk about anything, won't you? I will. Anything. Just let us know and we'll have a conversation about it. As always, it's brilliant. Great, co- great talking with you, Ed, as always. Great, great talking with you. Bar and banter yeah. at its finest. It's Perfect. lots lots of banter. And we'll, and we'll end with wishing Kings Loon all the best of luck for tomorrow. Lovely. Thanks very much, Ed. Great speaking to you. And uh, goodbye to the audience. Look forward to the next edition. Cheers. Yeah.